A UK football player has been kicked off the team following an arrest early this morning for trafficking marijuana. We'll let you know why FBI agents were at a home in this Lexington neighborhood. The Republican candidates for president have moved their campaigns to Nevada ahead of tomorrow's caucuses. We'll show you why it appears to be a race for second. This is WKYT News at 5. A University of Kentucky football player is off the team following an early morning arrest. UK dismissed Jason Hatcher hours after the Franklin County Sheriff's Office discovered a pound of marijuana in his car during a traffic stop. WKYT's Victor Puente has more on the arrest in our top story at 5. The Franklin County Sheriff says Jason Hatcher told them he was going from his mother's home in Louisville back to Lexington. He said Hatcher also told them that pound of marijuana belonged to someone else. Pat Melton says Jason Hatcher was stopped around 1 this morning as he was heading east on Interstate 64. His vehicle was doing 81 and 70. He says as that deputy was talking to Hatcher, he smelled marijuana. The deputy informed him he would be searching his SUV. He was going back to get his gloves out of his car, noticed the uh, individual inside with his flashlight on his phone looking around. Melton says when that deputy got back to the vehicle, he saw stems and seeds from marijuana on Hatcher's pants. He says the 21-year-old had tried to stuff a quarter pound worth down his pants. Another three quarters of a pound was in his passenger floorboard. Well, he was cooperative and, and uh, uh, you know, under the circumstances, I think probably as, as good as you could be. They arrested Hatcher and charged him with speeding, trafficking in marijuana, tampering with physical evidence, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Obviously, this young man made a, a, a grave error in judgment, and uh, he got charged uh, with the appropriate charges for what he did. Hatcher bonded out of the Franklin County Jail earlier today. His preliminary hearing is scheduled for March 15th. In Lexington, Victor Puente, WKYT. In the statement announcing Hatcher's dismissal, UK said there would be no further comment from the university. Neighbors watched as a dramatic scene unfolded in a Lexington neighborhood this morning. The FBI searched a home on Heartland Parkside Drive. That's off of Kennesaw Drive, not far from Armstrong Mill. We asked the FBI what was going on, but as WKYT's Kristen Candy shows us, the agency is not saying much about the investigation. We did talk with a woman inside that home. She gave us no information, and FBI agents are giving us very little information as well. What they will say is that their agents conducted a law enforcement activity Monday morning. Neighbors who were uncomfortable talking on camera noticed agents yelling outside the home around 8 a.m. One neighbor told us he counted 10 law enforcement officers surrounding the house. Shortly after going in, neighbors say they brought a young man out in handcuffs, loaded him into the front seat of a car, and drove off. They also reported seeing the man who owns the home questioned outside, then brought back inside. Neighbors say the couple who lives there, the Equals, have three boys. They say they've always been friendly and they've never suspected anything happening at the home. Neighbors say they saw agents remove a small backpack from the house. We watched them carry off several boxes. FBI agents told us at no time did they feel that those living on Heartland Parkside Drive were in any danger. And they're not commenting any further because they say their investigation is an open one. A spokesperson for the FBI out of Louisville says at this point they have not arrested anyone. In Lexington, Kristen Kennedy, WKYT. And Lexington police officers were also at the home. They say they were there on agency assist in order to have a clear marked presence. It's calm for now, but look out. We have some wild weather on the way for the rest of our week. It includes everything from storms to snow. WKYT Chief Meteorologist Chris Bailey is here now with an early check of that forecast. Yeah, basically Kentucky weather at its absolute finest or worst, depending on your perspective on that one. For us, eh, it's a little uh, cool to see all the crazy stuff coming from the sky, or at least in the forecast. We look outside right now, calm weather, nothing going on across Kentucky. Had some sun in northern Kentucky rest of the region stuck in the 40s with some overcast conditions. Humidity still up there, but winds are coming out of the northeast at 12. That should be a colder wind. Not the case right now, just not a lot of cold air across the eastern part of the country for now. That'll change here in a couple of days. You see the overcast across Kentucky. Look at all the moisture to the south. 
Well, all that's moving to the east. That's not going to impact our weather. May throw a little light rain into southeastern Kentucky, though, late tonight and tomorrow. Here's the main storm system coming out of the four corners, heading into the Lone Star State of Texas. Severe weather outbreak likely later tonight and into the day tomorrow for much of the deep south. Does not include Kentucky, though. Some thunder and lightning, certainly a possibility with that as our major storm rolls right on top of central Kentucky on Wednesday. That'll have high winds, followed by a big temperature crash and snow. That's right, we're going to go from thunder and lightning in 60s to snow in a matter of hours. A very, very cool hour by hour forecast when I could back in just a few minutes. All right, we'll see you then, Chris. Thank you. An online ad has landed a Lexington man in jail. The state Unit arrested 57 year old Christopher McClone after a month long undercover investigation. Investigators say it started after he posted an online ad saying he was, quote, a mature man looking for a high school hottie. McClone is charged with using an electronic device for the purpose of seeking a minor for sex. Investigators say they also found 17 marijuana plants at his home when he was arrested. The trial began today for a man accused of manslaughter. Our county by county coverage begins in Clark County. Police say that Demetrius Morton punched David Bailey in July of 2013 after Bailey began talking to a couple of young girls. Morton was charged with assault, but it was upgraded to manslaughter when Bailey died a couple of days later. Neighbors claim Morton was trying to protect the girls. In Carter County, seven puppies rescued after being found in a suitcase on the side of the road. The Ashland Animal Rescue Fund says a good Samaritan saw the suitcase moving, stopped, and found the puppies. The puppies were hungry and their suitcase was full of animal waste. The Ashland Animal Rescue Fund is now caring for them. Republicans have moved to Nevada ahead of tomorrow's caucuses. This is the final early voting state before the race for GOP nomination goes national. As Danielle Nottingham shows us, first place might already be sewn up. Elko, Nevada, a town of just 20,000 people, is the center of the Nevada caucuses today. Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Donald Trump's son are all making appearances there. Elko's important because it's a Republican stronghold in Nevada, but that stronghold may belong to Trump. The issues which are important to voters here are ones that they trust Trump more on. John Tuman is the chair for the political science department at UNLV. Is the race for Nevada a fight for second place? I think that's one way of looking at it. I think a lot of people are looking at whether or not it will be Cruz or Rubio that finishes in second place. At this point, I don't think that either one of them can close the gap with Trump. Which may be why Rubio and Cruz have focused their attacks on each other. Cruz says Rubio can't win. No candidate has ever won the nomination who didn't win one of the first two, one of the first three states. Only two people have done that, Donald and me. And Rubio is accusing the Cruz campaign of dirty politics. Every single day, something comes out of the Cruz campaign that's deceptive and untrue. Nevadans get one more day of mudslinging before the candidates move on to the Super Tuesday states. Danielle Nottingham, CBS News, Las Vegas. 13 states will vote on Tuesday, March 1st. Texas alone will offer more delegates than all of the early voting states combined. The Wildcats returning to Rupp tomorrow night after a tough loss at Texas A&M. And we're not sure exactly which players will be able to take the court. WKYT's Rob Bromley's here, and that's because, Rob, uh, they're facing a lot of injuries. Well, that's right. The Cats will be playing their third game in six days tomorrow night when Alabama comes into Rupp Arena. Alex Poitras could be back. He was resuming team activities today. We don't know about Derek Willis. Now, Willis rolled his ankle in the second half of Saturday's loss to Texas A&M. Today, he was seen on crutches at the Kraft Center, putting no weight on his right foot. So again, Kentucky may be shorthanded tomorrow night. Well, you always want a full compliment, so we don't want to go... We don't go without anybody, but I know we've got some, some other guys that have stepped up and some other guys' absences. So I know uh, with Coach's philosophy and next, next man up, um, you know, you look at what uh, Isaac did last game, really stepped up and was big for So we like to have everybody, but I think everybody's confident um, that if we do miss a couple pieces, then other guys will be ready to step in and, and do their jobs. Kentucky and Alabama tomorrow night in Rupp Arena. It's at 7 o'clock on ESPN. Alex Poitras has not played since the game at Tennessee on February 2nd. He has missed five games. UK defeated Alabama in Tuscaloosa back on January 9th, but the Tide has been playing much better basketball under first-year coach Avery Johnson. 
Rob, thank you. And even with the loss on Saturday, Kentucky still leads the SEC race by one game over Texas A&M, South Carolina, and LSU. North. They say it's made a big difference. Today, business owners celebrated the reopening of North Upper Street at West Short Street in downtown Lexington. The road reopened earlier this month after 18 months of construction. As WKYT's Mike Linden shows us, business owners say they're getting a boost now that people can get to them easier. We made it through, and I'm real grateful for that. After 18 months of construction, the 100 block of North Upper Street and West Short Street is back open, and business owners say they couldn't be more relieved. Sales, our sales were up 20% last week. Renata West Riley opened the Lexington Diner in 2014. Just a few weeks after opening, construction began, and North Upper Street was closed. She says despite nearly two years worth of headaches, she wouldn't move anywhere else. I mean, this is just the, the excitement and this is the hub of the energy right down here on Short Street. While North Upper Street has been open for several weeks, there's still some work left to be done. There's still part of the sidewalk that hasn't been finished, and the city has just recently finished installing parking meters. But regardless of the changes to come, business owners are glad to just finally have the road back open again. We're happy for the outcome, but it was a hassle. Ray Larson is an attorney with an office on North Upper Street. To celebrate the road reopening, Larson organized an unofficial ribbon cutting. We got to do it in 57.8 seconds because, you know, you don't stop everything, and we got to do it during a red light. He says with the road back open and traffic moving again, life along Upper Street is back to normal. This is a good time, and we're happy to have the, play, the, the street open again. In Lexington, Mike Linden, WKYT. Lexington city leaders say the next projects for the Short Street area of downtown is to finish revitalizing the old courthouse and restoring Short Street. When it comes to strokes and heart attacks, many people don't realize they're at risk until it's too late. Kentucky One Health's mobile cardio and vascular screening unit was in Lexington today. It allows you to get low-cost tests to determine your risk. If you have abnormal results, a nurse will follow up with you to make sure that you get the care that you need. The unit's next stop in Lexington is March 16th. You can check the schedule by visiting KentuckyOneHealth.org slash screenings. If you don't have a Prime account, you'll have to pay more to get free shipping on Amazon. The company has increased the free shipping requirement from $35 to $49. Amazon orders that include at least $25 in qualifying books will still ship for free. It's time now for better living, health, education, and consumer news that impacts your life. The flooring in your home could make you even sicker than first thought. The Centers for Disease Control says certain types of laminate flooring from lumber liquidators increase your risk for cancer. The CDC found exposure to formaldehyde in the flooring was greater than first calculated. That means people who have the flooring in their homes are nearly three times more likely to get cancer. CBS's 60 Minutes first reported last month that the flooring exceeded U.S. health and safety limits for formaldehyde. Every year, tens of thousands of Americans die from infections they pick up at hospitals. Hannah Daniel shows us how to, you can protect yourself and your loved ones during your next hospital visit. Heather Brighton had a knee replacement in 2013. Two days later, she knew something was terribly wrong. I started to have bouts and attacks of diarrhea, and it just wasn't going. I was, on, I was in the bathroom every two minutes. She picked up a life-threatening infection called C. diff while recovering in the hospital. You're not eating, you're dehydrated, and you're just losing tremendous amounts of weight. It's estimated one in 25 patients contract an infection from the hospital, and tens of thousands die every year from those infections. Betsy McCoy founded the committee to reduce infection deaths. She says patients need to be proactive and protect themselves. Most importantly, make sure visitors and doctors wash their hands before coming near you. It's hard to do. Patients are intimidated by those white coats and those nurses' uniforms, but you could be saving your life by asking them to do that. Also, doctors should wipe their stethoscopes in between patients. 
bring a canister of bleach wipes. Research shows wiping down surfaces around the hospital bed can reduce some infections by as much as 80 percent. Pull them out and wipe the high touch surfaces. By that I mean the bed rails, the over the bed table, the call button, the television clicker. Other steps patients can take, choose a hospital and surgeon with low infection rates. And days before surgery, bathe with chlorhexidine soap, which can remove harmful bacteria that may be on your skin. Brighton calls her experience a big wake-up call. I think hospitals try to make an effort about keeping their hospitals as sterile as possible. I think more needs to be done. She says patients need to be their own best advocates. Hannah Daniels for CBS News, New Hyde Park, New York. Each year, more than half a million people get C. diff infections at hospitals. Patients on antibiotics are usually susceptible to C. diff because antibiotics kill off intestinal bacteria.